Good morning. Today is April 3rd, Monday, and the subject is China. Now, of course, we're all consumed right now about with Trump. Um, and as our papers point out, he actually likes all the attention, hopes to be the next candidate and the next president again. But um, I do want to talk about China. Let me read you the uh, titles of a few recent op-ed page uh, pieces in the New York Times and elsewhere, because one of the things I want to address this morning is that the situation of U.S.-China policy is becoming a very serious matter, and um, not to give away my position, it is that the U.S. policy with respect to China is very much wanting. Very, We have rather unfortunate policy right now. But so let me um, read the titles. One is the US no longer is a dispensable mediator. Then David Brooks, who's hardly some kind of lefty liberal says the cold war with China has begun. Then an article, uh, that's similar. America can choose to have a Cold War with China. And then even a grimmer uh, title on the, uh, in The Economist, it's worse than you think with respect to U.S.-China policy. Now, lest you think that I think that Chinese government and its leader are some kind of heroes, uh, let me try to contextualize why I think the we are either at the beginning of or an impending Cold War with China, and why I essentially want to argue that we have much, to, we meaning the United States policy, has much to do with having created the situation. Now, first of all, let's not be delusional about China. China has is an authoritarian government. It's got a dictator by our standards. Uh, it lacks uh, press freedom. It violates human rights. It's, uh, some of its foreign policies are iffy. So I'm not trying to sketch China as some kind of virtuous, you know, lovely Northern European democratic society, nothing of the sort. But at the same time, and we've talked about this before, China is the most populous country in the world right now. Any day now, it'll be the largest economy. Uh, it is engaged almost everywhere in the world. Uh, China is involved in, of the 193 countries, one can comfortably say in 100 of those countries, involved how? Loans, construction projects, trade. Um, and we're, China is involved in many countries that one would learn uh, and be surprised because we think of them as US allies and so forth. So for example, Germany is unwilling to um, change its policies, its trade policies with China, right? Uh, the other European countries likewise. And we are saying, uh, you know, we need to contain China and everybody needs to sanction China and divest from China. So we in the U.S. have walked away from the idea of interdependence and that that's a virtue and that helps uh, uh, produce uh, reasonable international relations. Uh, we've walked away from that, but most European countries have not. It's not just Europe, um, Latin America. China has investments and China is making loans to any number of Latin American countries. I think I've mentioned before, uh, China is the dominant trading power with Chile, right, in South America. Who would have thought, right? China is involved with um, almost two thirds of African countries. China is involved in many South Asian, Southeast Asian countries and the Middle East. 
And you might have seen on the TV or read in the newspaper that China is beginning to play a role not just of trade and investments and uh, such, but for example, diplomatically. Recently, you might have seen pictures of China being the mediator between Saudi Arabia and, and Iran. Think about it. One is a, Saudi Arabia is a Sunni country. Iran is a Shiite country. Um, and they have conflicting interest in Yemen's and other places. Who goes to mediate and make peace? Not the United States, but, uh, but China. So China is literally all over the place, and all over the place economically in two ways, as I mentioned, one, trade, two, investments, three, debt, uh, making loans, um, some, quite a few countries who have difficulty or which have difficulty, I'm sorry, uh, getting loans from the IMF or the World Bank or private banks or bilateral loans. Uh, from Europe and elsewhere are getting loans from China. Now, uh, that's one layer. The second layer, of course, is that China is very busy uh, getting natural resources for many countries. That's especially true, for example, in Africa, but it's true elsewhere. What kind of natural resources? Copper, lithium, all the kinds of things that are needed for industrial relations. Those countries are happy to sell those things to China and it is a large it is a large market. China also is dependent on food from the rest of the world, the importation of rice for example and and other grains and so forth. Where's the where are they getting that from? All over the world, some Latin American countries and uh, that we consider to be part of the Western Hemisphere and not part in any way of Eastern Bloc. So what's the response to the U.S. about all of this? The response to the U.S. is to apply sanctions every, in every imaginable way. And I want to deviate for a minute and talk about sanctions. Somehow in the last few years, we've gotten into our heads that we can influence policies of countries, get them to change their national policies, get them to bring them to heel, so to speak, in support of US policies by placing sanctions on them. Placing sanctions on them has two effects. One, which I already mentioned, namely, uh, the interdependence is reduced and everybody is talking about, and certainly in the United States, becoming self-sufficient, be being less reliant on, especially in technology, on chips and other things, on China and other countries, uh, solar panels and all the rest. Uh, not only the Trump administration, but the Biden administration is urging that the U.S. be more self-efficient. Uh, and we bring some of these industries home and make us less dependent on, on China. Well, that sounds like a fine idea. And it's for some purposes, it is a fine idea. For example, a country in Europe or the United States ought to not be totally dependent on pharmaceuticals or portions of pharmaceuticals on, on external actors, right? Uh, when a plague hits, when uh, diseases need to be addressed, when flu epidemics break out, when regular medications that many of you are taking uh, are needed on an, an, on an ongoing basis, one shouldn't necessarily be entirely dependent. One should either have a backlog or a reservoir of those medications in within the country, because not only could bad relations with a country that produces these things um, create difficulties, but there can also be natural disasters and other things, right? So I am not arguing that uh, having some independent productions for some things, for example, medications, pharmaceuticals, doesn't make sense for most countries, including the United States. But I am arguing to, to say we can't, we shouldn't be importing shoes from China or some other place uh, or clothing. Uh, we should all produce that at home. Goes counter to the wisdom of comparative advantage, 
uh, which you might have you know studied in college in economics one. Uh, it also goes counter to the idea that if countries are interdependent and linked with each other economically, it makes it easier to deal with them in uh, in other in other issues. But from the U.S. perspective now, the attitude towards China is also other places in the world. Sanctions uh, get the, either bar things from coming into the country or lay on you know huge tariffs that no longer make it economical. Um, we are playing this game in lots of places, including with respect to Russia, by the way. And we assumed Russia would, it, it, our sanctions would immediately bite in Russia with respect to the Ukraine. And lo and behold, by and large, Russia has found a way to get what it's needed. Um, energy they can sell to China and other countries, arms they can continue to sell to all the countries that use Russian arms rather than American or European arms, for example, India. It can also, um, pro, you know, uh, circumvent or countries can circumvent technological stuff they need, for example, um, Russia very cleverly is now getting it through third countries, for example, allies, Armenia, right? So Armenia buys some technology that Russia needs that the U.S. is sanctioning, and then the Armenians send it to Russia and so on. So to begin with, sanctions often are porous, and there is a way around them. But also, it is... Um, it, it doesn't have the effect, the political effect in most instances that the U.S. imagines. So here we are, the U.S. applying one kind of sanctions on China after another, um, sometimes creating some difficulty for China. They have to find a way around, but reducing one's ability to influence China on policies and issues that one would like to have some influence. Now, as soon as I mention influence on China, I am not suggesting that we're about to have influence to change the regime in China. But it's also the case that we're not able to influence other countries to continue to trade and try to have normal relations with China, in spite of its very many hum political and human rights flaws. Why is this? Because most countries have learned, not all, but most countries have learned that the Cold War didn't make any sense, that it really was destructive everywhere, and that the world has changed since the end of the Cold War, and that the interdependence of tr based on trade and goods and investments and so forth make a lot of sense. They don't just make a lot of sense philosophically, they make national interest sense. That is to say, if the Germans want to sell their refrigerator and washing machines to China, and a lot of their industrial capacity was sending machinery and exporting it to China, by saying, oh, we will go along with American sanctions, we're not, you know, uh, place them on China, and we will stop trading these things with China. Who's going to be hurt by that? The German economy, right? So countries are looking out for their self-interest and are saying the world is, in fact, economically, technologically, uh, in many ways, interdependent. And some of that interdependence is can continue and is possible without um, applying what essentially are sanctions, which most of the time don't work very well, and in any event, don't have in the modern world, generally speaking, again, the impact of bringing the country to the heel. So all we've done with respect to China, the, to, with all the sanction stuff, instead of continuing to weave China into the world economy and to welcome this, by and large, uh, we all we are doing is getting the Chinese angry and getting the Chinese to say, okay, if we can't get this from the U.S., we either have to develop our own capacity or get it uh, from somewhere else. The other thing that um, American sort of bad-mouthing of China, for example, 
uh, TikTok, right, is another case of something that's been in the news. Of course, there are things on TikTok that shouldn't be. And of course, China can spy through TikTok. But that the same thing is true of other of our companies that are competitors of TikTok, which may not be attached to any Chinese company whatsoever. So even that is a kind of, as the Brits say, over-the-top response to a genuine problem, namely spying on the one hand and using data that is on, uh, on the social media uh, for nefarious purposes. Uh, tic- if TikTok is banned, uh, the Chinese will be in a, angry. Uh, the Chinese will take revenge in various technological ways. Uh, but it, in terms of spying on Americans and spying on the U.S. government and using data on TikTok, they'll still have access because there are other companies that com- that provide similar information. Maybe not as easily, but, but similar, similar information. Um, then, you know... The Chinese are spying. Look at the balloon, right? Horrendous, a balloon, a spy balloon flying over the United States. Well, this is not a good thing and ought to be criticized. But on the other hand, hello, we were flying uh, balloons over China and are spying, right? So some of the things we accuse the Chinese of, we ourselves are doing. I'm not saying that it is, um, you know, some kind of, utopian vision in which countries don't spy on each other. But we're taking this sort of high road arrogance of um, we don't do these things. It's the Chinese do these things. And by the way, the Chinese is an authoritarian and a dictatorial government. As I mentioned before, most countries in the world, even those democratically elected, are either half autocrats or even if they've been elected, for example, uh, Prime Minister Modi in, in India, he was elected and he may be unelected in the next election. I think he's termed out. But the fact of the matter is he's behaving like an autocrat, right? And autocracy is not a good thing. I'm all in favor of uh, having, you know, liberal democracies. But for a variety of reasons, partly having to do with technology, partly having to do with economic disarray. By technology, I don't just mean the accessibility of technology, but rather that people can see what happens in each other's societies through technology, uh, in part because many citizens of countries are unhappy because they're disadvantaged uh, within their own societies. Uh, And so they tend to move right politically and in some cases sufficiently right to have autocrats. True in in Europe, true in Hungary, true in Poland for all practical purposes. And even, you know, a lovely democratic society like Finland, which had a lovely, capable, young prime minister, has just had a vote, was it yesterday, the day before, and she was voted out of office and a more right-wing, right-of-center party uh, has the majority. Now, are they about to become a dictatorship? No, but you can see the inclination of even the Finnish people of saying our economic circumstances haven't been so good. It's it's a combination of COVID. It's a combination of the world economy. And the current prime minister hasn't enough done enough to resolve that. So let's vote for somebody. Let's vote for somebody else. So even democratic uh, European societies are in some cases having difficulties of people wanting to move to the right or in France potentially even to the left in the next election because they're unhappy with their situations. It's a way of taking revenge against against the government. So the fact that China is a very large and influenced country, influential country, and is an, aut- an autocracy uh, and is indeed a dictatorship and has all kinds of serious flaws in it is not 
at issue. What is at issue is how do you deal with China? And dealing with them by resurrecting walls, criticizing them in unfortunate and patronizing ways. For example, our uh, foreign uh, secretary of state in his first meetings with the Chinese when Biden administration came in office was absolutely insulting from the to the Chinese in from the Chinese perspective. Totally unnecessary. It's okay for a country to say we have issues, we have to work through them. But it's not okay for us to pretend that we are this shining democracy that everybody thinks is wonderful, in spite of the fact that, you know, uh, assault rifles are killing school children, the fact that we have the, lo the largest infant mortality rate in the world. Uh, uh, or one of them. The fact that unlike any, let's say, other industrial economy, we have the percentage of poor people in this country is larger. The fact that our healthcare system is very dysfunctional, but in comparison to other industrial countries and so forth, we don't look so great in the world right now. And unless we own up to that and stop patronizing others and stop attacking um, countries which indeed have flaws and indeed their flaws should be discussed, but not discussed in the way that you take on the world's biggest power in the 20th century and you make your relationships with those countries uh, tantamount to a new Cold War. That is very serious business. And as citizens, we better inform ourselves and we better hope that the next U.S. administration and Congress in particular uh, takes a different tone with respect to China. Criticism, yes. Respectful criticism, yes. Um, and in addition, part of the Cold War, which I haven't discussed, hasn't just been economic and sanctions. It's also military, right? We are building up a huge military arsenal at China's doorstep, presumptively to protect Taiwan. The Taiwanese uh, president was just here. And indeed, China should not be uh, using force to make Taiwan uh, uh, an integral part of China again. First, most observers believe that's not in the cards for the next year or two. But what is happening is that as we make a deal with Australia and ourselves and England to build lots of nu nuclear ships out there, which are once they're built, will be roaming around there. We're having uh, increased military activity in that part of the world. We're making deals with the Philippines to increase our military. So, uh, stuff uh, in the area, China, of course, is responding. So now China is investing huge amounts in gearing up its nuclear capacity. It's a nuclear state, but they're investing a lot more. They're investing in uh, naval ships. They're investing in every imaginable way, getting themselves set up for comp military competition with the United States. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. And while there are real grievances against China, where there are real concerns about Taiwan, this over-the-top rhetoric on the part of the United States government, on the part of Congress, and on the part of citizens who say, e gats, look, China bad, look at all the bad things they're doing, um, is very counterproductive. Now, let me raise the COVID issue. China, of course, got a justifiably bad rap over COVID and its secrecy and all the rest. Fair enough. It handled COVID and the world spread of COVID and so forth. China historically will have to take responsibility to it. But even there, you see, I think it's unfortunate that we're consumed and Congress is consumed by arguing whether or not it came from animals or came from a lab accident. There are serious studies, each of which other. It is important for China, and it is important for China to get to the bottom of this. 
it is unimportant and ill-conceived and unfortunate to be thrown around the body of politics where people who are just want to do China bashing are consuming themselves with that. Let the scientists look into it. Let the scientists get a handle on it. Uh, if it can't be sorted out, it can't be sorted out. If eventually it is sorted out, um, then each country, China and the rest of the world and the United States can put policies in place to uh, deal with the selling of uh, the animals at markets and can put policies in place that protect labs or make labs more carefully. I'm not saying there isn't an issue there, but the issue is not bad China, good the United States, let's hit them over the head with it. So whether it's the spinoff from COVID, whether it's military buildup, whether it's sanctions and unfortunate policies uh, with respect to China, it is the US, it is not China at the moment, which is ramping up a Cold War with China, which is of no interest to anybody in the United States, is of no interest to China or the rest of the world. And furthermore, as the rest of the world sees the US do this, many of them are stepping back, as I suggested in the beginning, uh, but essentially saying, yes, yes, China needs to be criticized in terms of the Uyghurs and its lack of free press and all the rest of it. But on the other hand, uh, we have to live with it. Uh, we can comment on it, we can urge it, but we're going to continue to have interdependent relations with China. Why? Because we're ideologically committed to China? No, because it's in the national interest of European countries, of Asian countries, uh, to have ongoing relations with China. Uh, it's in their interest economically. It is increasingly in their interest financially. It is in their interest um, in terms of also having access to raw materials. Uh, so what are we gaining by playing this over-the-top criticism of China, of China game? And furthermore, China at various junctures has loosened up a bit, and down the road, maybe post Xi or at some point, will loosen up a bit again in terms of its domestic politics. China suffered a lot from the COVID crisis. It is having some economic difficulties. Uh, at the moment itself, whether China can write its own ship domestically is still an open question. And so this is a particularly bad time to keep, uh, you know, uh, banging away at China and asserting U.S. democracy superiority, we can mediate, the world will listen to us, the world sees that we're the model democracy and so forth. The world no longer sees it. We have lost our reputation as the honest broker and mediator for many things in the world. And rather than trying to recapture that, uh, and recapture a more constructive role in the world. What we're really doing is eating away at the influence and status which we enjoyed, certainly in the post-Cold War period. I think this is both very sad and very unfortunate. And as citizens, I think we should talk to our representatives, even the Democrats are part of this game right now. It's not just Republicans, it's Democrats as well, and urge people to stop the China bashing. Yes, reasonable criticism, reasonable uh, displeasure, certain things is certainly called for, but you can't, you know, throw the baby or you shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater on this particular case. So what I would like to urge you to do, we'll have to talk more about China and different aspects down the road, is to, in a sense, you know, read some of what you can read in the papers and the journals where people who are perfectly serious, who are right, left, and center, are saying, whoa, America, this, you're asking, and we're asking as Americans for trouble through our policies, and it's no longer either a Democratic or Republican uh, situation. And it is difficult for declining powers, which the U.S. is, we're not declining 
power economically yet. We're not declining militarily yet. Uh, we may in this century, uh, but for a declining power in terms of influence to be as pompous and as ill-informed as we are, and in even more importantly, not to look out for our long-term self-interest. And I guess my message is our China policy right now is, no, is not just not in China's interest and the world interest, but it certainly is not in the U.S. interest. Thank you very much for listening. See you again in two weeks.